Coming up on News 2, what are your thoughts about the permit application by Coral World to construct a dolphin exhibit? That will be the center of a public hearing Thursday night. A veteran wildlife biologist is in town to add his voice to the debate. Plus, education officials and local farmers partner to bring farms to schools. The announcement came during the Agricultural Conference. Hello, welcome, and thanks for joining us on this edition of News 2. I'm Sandra Gaman Singh. Topping on newscasts tonight, the Department of Agriculture and Education teamed up Thursday to host a one-day conference for farmers. And during that meeting, education officials and one local farming organization formed a partnership that hasn't been seen since the 50s and 60s. News 2's Erica Parsons has that story. Rich to Reef Farm will be providing food for the territory schools starting next month. I'm just excited as well. You know, I have a lot of family and friends in, in the school system, so it's going to be pretty exciting to get to get the food to them that way. On Thursday, farming officials signed the food supply contract for the school lunch program. Using local farmers is a first for the program. What we have done is we have restructured the bid a little differently to include purchasing local fresh fruits and vegetable. Because of the new meal pattern requirement that requires us to serve fresh fruits and vegetable, we wanted to cater it more to our farmers. And we did that through the Farm to School initiative that says purchase locally. Summer Sibley Brown has been pushing for this partnership to bring local healthy foods to the school lunch table. It's really uh, something to jump through the roof about because it's been about three years in the making where my role has been trying to collect connect the Department of Education with a farmer who at the time was capable of supplying food and could get onto the procurement cycle. So for the first time in three years and the first time in um, Virgin Islands history, I mean in a long time, we have a local farmer who will be supplying local goods to the school and it feels really good because we've worked really hard to get here. Rich Tarif has the contract to provide about eight different types of foods. The farmer says hundreds of cases of green leafy and colorful fruits and vegetables will be delivered. You think your whole life you want to contribute to other people. You know, at least that's how I felt and this is like a real way, especially as a farmer, to be able to put food right where it's needed most our children who need real nutrition, they need beauty and color and exciting food to have as the, as the, as the, as the base layer to all that education. And officials hope the students who benefit will take healthy eating home and make it the norm. Erica Parsons, News 2. Now, meanwhile, USDA and local agriculture officials educated farmers and members of the community about the ways they can increase their food production. Experts were on hand at the Expansion and Marketing Conference to talk about resources available to help fund and support the growers. In the territory, we have good farmers. Of course we do. They're hardworking farmers as well. They do produce and they do market. But we know that the maximum potential of production and marketing is not yet realized. So what we're hoping to do today is to furnish them with some more tools for their toolboxes that they can put to use. So we have divided today into about five panels there about, and the panels cover a range of topics, topics including programs, opportunities, grants, loans that farmers can apply for, also new innovations in farming that farmers can put to use that we have not yet put to use in the territory as well as, of course, programs such as the school lunch program and other programs that farmers can tap into to expand their current marketing opportunities. The different Senate committees made their brief reports to the Senate President on Thursday. In other news, Senator Clarence Payne, Chairman of the Health and Hospitals Committee, gave updates on two health-related issues, the chikungunya epidemic and the crisis at Juan Louis Hospital. According to the experts, the condition will peak by December. So between now and December, the community should continue to expect an increase in the amount of those who will contract the virus. We are scheduling a hearing on Wang Louis Hospital within a week. We do expect a very robust and very challenging discussion with the executives of the hospital Time. because CMS has really levied some very serious allegations against them. 
In other Senate news, Senator Kenneth Gittins expressed appreciation to his colleagues of the 30th legislature for their support for the override of the governor's veto of Bill No. 30-0356, an act to amend 33 VIC Section 3080, abolishing pension payments to spouses of deceased governors and lieutenant governors. The bill, which is now public law, removes the pension entitlement for spouses of deceased former governors and lieutenant governors. The override call received 10 yes votes and four no votes with one absent. Let me make clear that this is a matter of principle, not personality. The measure passed to grant it, uh, lucrative pensions to deceased governor spouses is ill-considered and should never have occurred given our territory's severe financial condition. I look forward to working with my colleagues on any measure that will be fair and equitable and allow future governors and lieutenant governors or even elected officials to make contributions to a system that will allow for them to provide spousal benefits to their spouses following their passing. Committee on Rules and Judiciary, chaired by Senator Samuel Sanez, as we reported on Wednesday, approved a measure amending the Hotel Development Act to authorize contingent lease guarantees. Committee members spoke favorably in support of the measure, Bill No. 30-0431, sponsored by Senator Alicia Chucky Hansen. The senator shared that the measure had garnered the attention of members of the business community as well. She said officials in the hotel industry had already expressed interest in the project in the District of St. Croix that will house 400 rooms, a 1,500-seat convention center, and also employ more than 1,000 construction workers. District Court Judge Curtis Gomez today sentenced J. Antonio Edwards, 41, to 100 months in prison for attempted possession of cocaine with intent to distribute. After a three-day jury trial on March 19th, Edwards was convicted of attempted possession of cocaine with intent to distribute. Evidence at trial established that on October 22, 2011, Edwards attempted to retrieve six kilograms of sham cocaine that he believed had been shipped to Atlanta from St. Thomas as part of a drug conspiracy. Leal Benjamin Jr., Aben Marrero, and Michael Samuels, all of whom were convicted in a separate trial, conspired to smuggle cocaine through the Shirley King Airport to Atlanta. Benjamin and Marrero were employees of the VI Port Authority assigned to the maintenance division. The co-conspirator was arrested at the Hartsfield-Jackson Atlanta International Airport after arriving on board a flight from St. Thomas with cocaine. 7.025 kilograms in his carry-on suitcase. The co-conspirator agreed to cooperate with the government and made consensually monitored telephone calls that resulted in the apprehension of Edwards. During his trial, Edwards was acquitted on the conspiracy count. In addition to 100 months in prison, Edwards was sentenced to five years of supervised release in order to pay $100 special assessment and forfeit $113,000 to the United States. Police on St. Thomas arrested 34-year-old Hakeem Brooks after they say he and two accomplices hit and kicked a victim as well as pulled out handguns, then took $370 in cash from the victim's pocket. Brooks was arrested about 4.45 p.m. on September 22nd. He was charged with first-degree robbery, third-degree assault, and grand larceny. Police said that on September 15th, about 6.30 Brooks robbed and assaulted the 28-year-old victim in the area of Pyle Strott. His bill was set at $160,000, and he was remanded to the Bureau of Corrections pending his advice of rights hearing. Turn our attention overseas amid a sustained campaign targeting ISIS with airstrikes in Syria. President Obama asked the United Nations General Assembly to stand with the U.S. in its efforts to dismantle the terror group. Some experts say the speech helped rally the world against a common em enemy. Five Arab allies have joined the U.S. in strikes. The latest round targeted the group's mobile oil refineries. And now Great Britain may be joining the ongoing mission in Iraq. The president is asking members of the U.N. Security Council to follow through on a U.S. resolution to crack down on recruitment and travel of foreign fighters supporting Islamist extremists. Keeping our eye on the economy, Apple says it's working around the clock to fix a glitch in its new operating system. The tech giant made, made the rare move of pulling an update to iOS, iOS 8 
they were trying to fix text messaging and health kit problems, but people who downloaded the new software couldn't make calls. Apple is also dealing with Bengate. Some iPhone 6 Plus customers complained the phone can bend. Here's a look at the New York Stock Exchange with our stock market watch. Everything down, the Dow 264, NASDAQ 88, S&P 32. Coming up on News 2, what are your thoughts about the permit application by Coral World to construct a dolphin exhibit? A public meeting is underway. It's hosted by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers from the Jacksonville District. The National Day of Remembrance for Murdered Victims was established as a result of unanimously passed resolutions by the U.S. Senate on October 16, 2007. Residents on St. Thomas gathered at 5.30 on the waterfront apron in honor of loved ones lost to violence. A release of balloons was held. Many wore red and black, the official colors to signify National Day of Remembrance for Murdered Victims. Meanwhile, on St. Croix, a commemoration activity for children kicked off at the Women's Coalition Children's Center on King Street. That began at 5.30 and continues until 7.30. Divi Sack and the Women's Coalition collaborated to host the event for children who have lost their loved ones due to violence. Be sure to count on News 2. We'll have more on Friday's newscast. The debate over Coral World's proposed Dolphinarium continues. Stakeholders are at a public hearing going on right now at the Charles Turnbull Library to weigh the pros and cons. News 2's April Knight talks to a longtime wildlife expert and gets his take on the controversial dolphin habitat. Coral World has already started building its hotly debated dolphin habitat, but opponents of the proposed dolphin facility say the fight isn't over yet. DJ Schubert, wildlife biologist at the Animal Welfare Institute in Washington, D.C., is in the Virgin Islands to add his voice to a public hearing on the topic on Thursday night. There must be more transparency so everyone that's interested in this project, whether they oppose it, or whether they support it, have an adequate opportunity to participate in the decision-making process. Coral World says they're not capturing animals from the wild. They're bringing in dolphins already born in captivity. But Schubert says this does not get them off the hook. What's troubling to the Animal Welfare Institute is they haven't identified that captive source. We question, what will that original source do? Will they stop holding dolphins? Will they go out and find more dolphins to fill the gap. Beyond the ethical concerns, the Animal Welfare Institute is also worried of the environmental risks posed by a concentrated group of dolphins in a small area. These animals produce waste. That waste will be co concentrated because they're in a captive space. Because of tidal currents, they'll impact species that are outside the project footprint. The dolphin facility is projected to add at least 25 jobs and some 4 million in annual revenues to the territory. But Schubert says captive dolphin shows is a dying trend. It's already banned in countries like India, Hungary and Costa Rica and could lead to a boycott by eco-conscious tourists if it's built on St. Thomas. It reflects an old mindset that's uh, no longer relevant in a, in a modern world where, again, people are saying we want our animals in the wild, not in captivity. Reporting for News 2, I'm April Knight. Be sure to count on 2 to keep you updated on Coral World's Dolphin Habitat proposal. Well, there was a great turnout at the recent fair held at Antilly School and more opportunities to mark on your calendar. There will be a presentation held by reps from Brown University on Monday, October 6, 7 p.m., at Antilly School, then three locations, as 33 Catholic colleges and universities will be visiting St. Thomas. That's on Wednesday, October 8th. Fairs will be held at Antilly School, and uh, that's from 9 to 10.30 a.m., then at Charlotte Amali High School from 11.20 a.m. to 12.30 p.m., and also Ivana Udora Ken High School from 2 to 3 p.m. Have you seen a brightly colored butterfly flutter by lately? Well, if you purchased a sheet of the September 25th VI lottery ticket, then you would have noticed 19 different species of butterflies displaying their beautiful, colorful wings, a product of Mother Nature's palette. Were you the lucky one to fly away with the $175,000 grand prize? Here are the winning numbers.
The VI Lottery presents drawing results of today's drawing on News 2. Here are the top prizes. Fifth prize for $20,000. 32214. 32214. Fourth prize for $30,000. 05589. 05589. Third prize for $40,000. 15219. 15219. Second prize for $65,000, 07207, 07207. And the winning ticket number for the grand prize for $175,000 is 08592, 08592. If your ticket number wasn't called, keep trying. One of these days, your number could win. The next drawing is October 9th. Play the VI Lottery and imagine the possibilities. Well, uh, good luck as you check those tickets. Be sure to stick around. Your news to AccuWeather forecast comes your way next.